Well, this is work done with the help, of course, the magnificent Dr. John Naughton and our colleague Dr. Corey Wolfenon. Corey in the field. So, we'll go ahead and just get started. Um, so, this is an overview. Of course, you got to motivate, figure out what hole we're trying to fill, do a little bit of background. Why do we even care about squirrel? What are we looking at? How are we going to do it? Can we do it the right way? And what are we actually doing? And how do we jump from experiment to model? Which is not the sole goal, but it is an important goal. So, oh, um, <laughs> this is a skin friction test um, using an oil interferometer. Uh, the bad thing is UV, I don't really make good fringes, so it didn't really work out the way we planned. But anyways, <laughs> um, moving to motivation, right? In the galaxy far, far away, the time long, long ago, when was the predominant source of energy? Unfortunately, that's not how it works. It's in Star Wars. Um, and this is a Dagobah tattoo. Wind energy has amazing potential. But we know array losses, to be honest, they just suck. Um, and turbine weights play a large role in how wind farms produce energy. So we need to understand it. decay, growth, convection, how do we deal with this? So going into the background, there's been plenty of studies performed in the field, right? I ain't at all, many more. That's at the system level. But there's a lot of complex stuff going on. You have the effects of terrain, you have boundary conditions, repeatability. You have the same conditions that you had on Tuesday, you have on Wednesday. Then you go into the wind tunnel, it's a little bit better. We got a model flow. The awesome Mark Watson back there, 2013. But even then, you now have complicated geometries. You have hub wakes, turbine wakes, power wakes. Does that change the behavior? And then we kind of make this jump to the unit problem, right? Where you only have one essential flow physics. We have axial momentum deficit. And we've done a great job on axis symmetric wave. But there's a gap, right? The benchmark problem where you just have two flow physics. Axial momentum deficit and the apartment of rotation, the more basic angle momentum. And that's where we feel like we can fill the gap. We feel like there is a need for a fundamental study of just the axisymmetric turbo source of energy. One, to understand what's going on in this flow. Two, to maybe provide a data set validation to build up on. So this is going to talk about the relevance of swirl. I know those videos aren't funny, but whatever. Um, so we've simulated the NRO 1.5 and 5 megawatt turbine, both the EM and Aqua line models. Courtesy of Rod Drive, because it's a system for Western now. And we're trying to develop relevant links of the swirl. When we talk about swirl, this is the number right here. Ooh, fancy that blade. Um, so we're talking about angular momentum imparted and actual momentum deficit <laughs> basically convected downfield. And if these plays, this will show you slices of basically angular velocity as you move through wide and tangential. Uh, so going into Range, and we can either integrate the equations or we can <coughs> scale and all that kind of jazz and make it happen. I will bore you with the details, but we find out there's a few important terms. So we have, of course, have infinity, frequency velocity on the side of the way. We have e minus infinity, which is your weight deficit. Uh, we have, of course, u Reynolds squared, root of Reynolds stress, v Reynolds stress, uh, w, which is, of course, your actual swirl rotation velocity. Also, w fluctuations, v fluctuations. So what does this tell us? I'll jump. We need velocity in three different dimensions. Okay. Um, that's what needs to be done. So we kind of need to look at the field. Uh, either really accurate point measurements in these three dimensions, or, yeah, pretty much field measurements in three dimensions. But we can't get the full story if we're talking about rotation without at least three dimensional studies. So how do we go about doing that? Um, we have an open wind, open wind, wind tunnel. Low purpose intensity, less than 3%. Uh, it's about two feet by two feet. And so in there, we mount our own custom designed weight generator. Uh, we generate our weight with just a porous disc or a honeycomb. Uh, we have various porosities going from about 0.15 centimeters to 0.6 centimeters. We'll get to that day later. Our rotation is controlled by a silver motor um, that we also control through that view. And we mount the model, and this is the cool part, by wires uh, to minimize flow back from power effects. So there's no sting mount. Uh, basically, it's mounted pretty much suspended in the tunnel. And the same wires we mount by is the same wires we provide control and power with. Uh, that allows us to do some cool stuff. We use revision of particle image for all symmetry. And we did two lasers in one experiment, and then later one, we actually used one. We'll talk about that. So this is our current model. Uh, this is the flow direction. Of course, we have a nose cone, because we love that in aerospace, and it can be smooth and nice. Um, but these are the copper supply wires. So these actually mount, but also provide power and control to the motor that's housed inside this body. We also have these stainless steel support wires. One interesting thing to note is you look at these screws. Uh, something that we wanted to do with the design was make it be able to be rapidly fixed. Uh, things break quite often. And one of the biggest problems we had last time when we did our initial experiments, when things broke, it took 
days to fix uh, with a small machine or you're pulling it all apart. With this design, you just unscrew a wire, put another one in, and tighten it back up. No big deal. Um, this was actually designed in CAD and then put on a water jet to be made and then actually just black and to get my reflection. This is just an image of the overall testing setup. And this is schematic. So, as you can see up here, we have our two cameras. They're both 2048 by 2048, so roughly about 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters of your distance. So you need to line them up back to back and get about 12 diagrams down stream, or you put them at an angle and get stereoscopic images. Uh, we also have, of course, a support wire. We have a two-legged from both sides to create a nice sheet. So this is our newer setup, uh, but we're actually just beginning testing this. So this is something we wanted to do uh, for a few different reasons. So as you can know, the laser is now on top of the tunnel and it's directed downwards, uh, creating the beam sheet this way. But by changing the optics, we can also make the beam sheet this way. And so this allows us to do both transverse and longitudinal planes with the same setup without changing anything, uh, and basically just calibrating. And then also, these cameras and this laser sheet are all fixed to each other. And so our hope is that we can calibrate this once for transverse and once for longitudinal. And then even if we transverse the system, we have to do multiple calibrations every time. Uh, so right here is just some raw PI images just showing that we can pull particles as you can tell. Uh, that's the end of the weight generator. Uh, this is flow direction that way. That's our computer probe just kind of sitting there. Nice reflection. Uh, and so this is again to the preliminary results. So this is what our first initial setup. And so when the first thing you know is we increase swirl and swirl's going down this way. So swirl we're talking about ratio of angular momentum and particle weight deficit. We get much deeper weights, right? But we also get increased weight decay. If you look down here, it's much fainter. But we also get increased weight growth. It's a little bit wider. Um, we can show this a little better in the next plots. But this is center line velocity normalized by the free shooting. And this is weight half weight normalized <coughs> by the initial diameter. And so as you can tell, these red triangles being the largest amount of swirl. Uh, this is weight Reynolds number. There's a sudden jump in slope, right? You go from these squares to here. And so there's a certain mechanism that's changing. As we add swirl, something just snaps and changes. And that's a really interesting thing. Uh, we're not exactly sure exactly what it is yet. Um, we're still getting started with this, but this is something that we definitely want to examine and figure out what's going on. This is some of our first stereoscopic data. This is actually doubling velocity. Uh, as you can tell, this is a highly interesting flow field. I mean, look at this kind of, this, all kind of structures going on. And this is just 300 images, right? So this is just the beginning. Um, and actually, if you look at the image of the mean, you have a nice velocity up, velocity down on both sides. But this is something we definitely want to examine. See the content going on in this flow. So earlier we talked about case specification, and what do we mean with that? So one interesting thing we talked about was these different porosities. So when we first started this experiment, uh, to be quite honest, <laughs> we took a piece of honeycomb and water jet it and threw it on something that spun it around, and we got some rotation that was great. So we wanted to create a little bit more control, and so something I tried was like, hey, what happens if we change the porosity? Right? Just curious what would happen. The difference between this porosity and that porosity at the same rotation speed is rather startling. This one, as you increase rotation speed, you saw those images, deeper weights, increased growth rates, increased decay rates. This one, you get the opposite. Same rotation rate, opposite thing. And so what we're finding, and which makes sense, is that this weight deficit, this wall number, and this angular momentum, they're kind of coupled. So you kind of need to look at the design space, and we need to take LDA or some other point-wise measurement to accurately quantify what each one of these does. Figure out the relevant cases of weight deficit, figure out the relevant cases of angular momentum, and then match the right porosity with the right rotation rate to actually study it and really create the physics flow field. So we talked about going from experimental uh, measurement campaign to high fidelity modeling. So one of the biggest things that we're trying to focus on is what can we provide to make it easier to model these data? Can we help you supply basically a complete and competent data set? And the biggest things are boundary conditions, precise geometry, and testing limitations. So like I said, the first thing is that this is a low turbulence intensity tunnel. This is not a bonds layer tunnel. We don't have 20% turbulence intensity. We just don't have it. Eventually, we want to add an active grid, um, which will go somewhere up between here. And then we can start doing some stuff like that. But until now, this is not the data to do that. We don't have beer or shear. It's pretty much a line correct tunnel. We can possibly yaw it, but that's not what we're doing right now. So if that's what you're trying to do in your model, we just can't help you. However, we have a very simple design. It's pretty well documented in CAD. This is all modeled up in SolidWorks. 
pretty easily given out, even the wires and the mounting points all modeled. Um, and we also can do a pretty good job pressure grading. So, so one of the things we're planning to do is one going hot wire to adequately characterize incoming flow, flow intensities and turbulence, and also to use pressure taps uh, when building a wall to insert to measure pressure gradients. So that models can say, hey, you may have to put walls in, but if you know the boundary condition of the pressure gradient, we can now kind of simulate what's going on. So to conclude, big takeaways, squirrel modifies weight behavior. Um, it's pretty clear, uh, based on some initial testing we've done, we feel like it's relevant to the right range of issues and concern. Um, and that stereoscopic PIB can really yield some valuable information that seems to plots. There's a lot going on in this flow. It's pretty interesting. But the other bigger takeaway is that weight deficit and angle momentum are kind of coupled. And it's really coupled on how you produce it. And so you really have to take the time to think about those trade-offs between rotation rate and velocity and how you're making the weight to figure out what you really want to get out of it. Uh, for future work, we really just need to study the effect on turbulent structure. That's something we haven't looked at yet, because we want to get into possibly using POD and other methods. And definitely characterizing the flow, whether it's the weight generated from labor behavior or the actual inflow of turbulence, turbulence intensity. And the last thing is just accurately, accurately defining experimental boundary conditions so that we can start publishing this data and making it available for modelers and really make some progress with it. So here's my references with that. My acknowledgments, of course, as always, NSF because they pay the bills, and Gates because they pay the bills, and uh, HG because we have to give shout outs to all the people that make us live in their day to day lives. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. What questions do you have? <laughs> a couple of quick questions. So, in, in the near field, uh, you find that uh, the deficit and the rotation are coupled. Basically, this, this is what we're talking about right now when you look at some work from Rockfield Chris and how you get swirling weight. There's some of this momentum deficit locked up in pressure gradient, right? That rotation causes some kind of pressure gradient in the flow that eventually kind of competes in effect. And so that's what we're looking at is are we really looking at this the right way? Because like you said, it should work that way. But right now, we're not accounting for any kind of pressure gradients or any kind of things like that, which do act out to kind of change momentum as you move down downstream. But, but the only, the only uh, rotation you're adding is at the rotor. There's mm -hmm. nothing Yep. That's, yep. That's, that's conservative. Third, that's absolutely. Downstream. Yep. If you, if you go, what was the furthest uh, X over D you went? We only went 12 diameters down, so we're still not that far down. Yeah. How far? 12 diameters down. Well, we should start this. It's probably right, it's probably right about where they, where they, where, well, it's a soil number, of course. Yeah. But the, that's, you know, 12, 10 to 15 is where they really should be. Well, around what score numbers did you see that happen at? Uh, I'll go down on this in diameter. Okay. Well, check that out, definitely. That's a bit higher than the one. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely check that out, definitely. Any other questions? Yes. Have you done any work, uh, any modeling to try to do sensitivity analysis? and? predict where, where that happens? No, we haven't, and that's something we definitely need to do. It's hard to try to quantify errors, gaps, uncertainties. Um, one thing, that, one of the other big pushes why we went to stereoscopic was due to the in introduction of error to the battle plane velocity. And just acknowledging that if we did not do stereoscopic and we were looking, and we definitely have a W velocity coming out from creating it, there's errors. Um, so that was one attempt to kind of you know, handle some of those uncertainties, we definitely need to do some sensitivity. So, it's a good point. Let's take a speaker. We have to move on to the next one.